All right, hello again. Hope you're doing well. This is lecture number three. Uh, this should be actually a, a fairly short one. Fairly short, we'll see. But we're covering now um, musical elements beyond the three dimensions we talked about last time. So last time we talked about melody, harmony, and rhythm. Now we're going to go beyond that. Specifically, we're going to talk about timbre. I know that word looks like timbre, uh, but it's actually pronounced timbre. It comes from a French word. Form and texture. Sometimes you'll see people include other things, uh, dynamics, tempo, articulations, etc., etc. For the purposes of this course, we're going to keep it pretty simple. So, uh, timbre, form, and texture. <laughs> Here we go. So, last time we talked about melody, harmony, rhythm, and how those are sort of the most important and basic uh, musical elements. Well, we're going to now go beyond that and uh, talk about some some other elements that have a huge role in the way things sound. Okay, first of all, timbre, really important. In fact, if you've been reading the text, which I'm sure you have, I'm sure you've been reading it nonstop, um, the author talks quite a bit about um, timbre and how important it is in terms of what kind of music we like. In fact, for most of us, we most people basically decide the kind of music they like exclusively based on timbre. So it's a genre thing. People like the sound of rock and roll versus R and B versus um, you know pop versus reggae versus bluegrass versus country. Mostly, those distinctions are. Uh, timbre distinctions you can take the same melody the same harmony and even the same rhythm and uh, play it in a different style and it becomes a completely different piece um, I, I popped in an example here I think of uh, a really um, exaggerated uh, example of this so this is the song somewhere over the rainbow but it's gonna sound a little different than you used to So <laughs> the melody is actually the same, believe it, or not, believe it or not. You can hear in the guitar, and he is kind of singing. He's kind of screaming at times, but there is there is the contour of the melody for sure, even w with his screams. Um, and then you you have the timbre of, in this case, like a, kind of a death metal thing. So you've got like really loud, aggressive drums, guitar. Um, his his singing is very aggressive. So so if you like death metal, you probably like that. If you don't, then you probably don't. Um, the The challenge that I'm, I'm trying to get to that we've talked about already a little bit in some of the other lectures is starting to listen to music beyond just the most superficial aspects of it. So yeah, timbre is important and um, interesting, but try and go beyond timbre and try and hear that it actually is the same melody as the original, you know, Wizard of Oz movie. And, and try and notice those kinds of similarities that, that actually, in terms of musical content, they're actually very similar. But <clears throat> it's important to understand that um, timbre is really important in influencing the kind of music we like, the kind of genres we like. Again, from the text, uh, the definition he gives of timbre is pretty interesting. You know, it's, it's, it's always um, a unique situation when scientists have to define something by what it isn't what it is not versus what it is. And, and timbre is one of these things. They've had a hard time pinning down exactly what timbre is, but essentially the way they define it in the text is all of the acoustical properties of a sound except for pitch and duration. So that means everything about the way um, a musical sound sounds except for how high and low it is and how long it lasts. Um, and, and think of it like this. If we had two instruments playing the same exact note and uh, normally this is where I would go to the piano in class but since um, we don't have a piano I'm going to pull up a music app on my phone here I'm going to pull up an app that has a fake piano on it and hopefully 
you'll be able to hear this. I'm going to play a note. I'm going to play this note. Where's my speaker here? I'm going to play it right into the microphone. So hopefully you can hear that. Um, <clears throat> well, if I were to match that pitch. La. La. They're still incredibly easy to tell the difference, right? See if you can tell the difference. Which one is my voice and which one is the fake piano? La, la. It's really easy, right? I know that was stupid, but the point is you can easily hear the difference between the two. And the, the reason for that is despite the fact that they have different timbres, despite the fact that they have, um, or excuse me, despite the fact that they have the same frequency, uh, they have different timbres. And so everything about the sound except for the frequency is what makes the piano sound like the piano and everything about my voice except for the frequency is what my voice makes my voice sound like the voice and that makes it very e easy to distinguish between the two so hopefully that makes sense as to what timbre is it's everything about a sound except for uh, frequency and duration that really means in a practical sense when you're listening to pieces and you're uh, using the word timbre uh, to describe the music you're, you're hearing, that most is going to mean what instruments you're hearing and then the range of the instrument. So um, the piece that I've chosen for my presentation uh, features a lot of high electric guitar. And the high electric guitar creates this timbre that's kind of piercing and, um, you know, soars over the ensemble or something like that. Uh, so we're going to take a second to talk about the different families of instruments. You may want to take notes on these just in case as we're going throughout the semester. Um, you want to be able to reference the different instruments that are possible. So first of all, I don't know if you know this, but instruments are divided into families. So we have a woodwind family, a brass family, string family, percussion family, and a voice family. And then I like to add the electronic family because um, technology has created all of these new instruments that uh, are essentially electronic in nature. So the reason you should also know the reason they're grouped in the families they're grouped in is based on the source of the vibration. All sound must be created by vibration. There's not a sound you've ever heard in your life that is not created by vibration. Well, what all the woodwind instruments share in common here, and you can see we've got flute, clarinet, saxophone, oboe, bassoon, recorder, there are more, by the way, I'm kind of simplifying things. But what they all share in common is that the source of the vibration is a column of air, meaning you blow. And when you blow, um, it causes something to vibrate, it causes something to spin. In the case of uh, the reed instruments, so like saxophone and clarinet, there's a very thin piece of wood that you attach to a mouthpiece, and when you blow, the piece of wood vibrates, and that's the source of the sound. Um, for the flute, flute is kind of interesting. What happens actually is the air spins inside the head joint, and that's what causes the sound. It's actually the same phenomenon. I don't know if you've ever taken like a, a Coke bottle or an empty water bottle or a partially empty water bottle, and you try and angle it just right so you get that hum when you blow into it where it goes... That's basically the same exact way that a flute makes a sound. Um, so you have to practice getting good at that. I also just want to mention, I'm not going to go into detail, but there are a bunch of different flutes. So there's a piccolo flute. There's the normal flute we call like the C flute. Uh, there's an alto flute. There's actually bass flute. Um, same with clarinet. I mean, clarinet's one of the biggest um, instrument families you've got. E flat soprano clarinet, B flat soprano clarinet, you got E flat alto clarinet, B flat bass clarinet, E flat contra alto clarinet, B flat contra bass clarinet. It's, it, so each one of these, there are multiple, but these are the most common versions of each um, type. So just so you know. All right, brass family, what all the brass instruments share in common is that the source of vibration is the uh, buzzing of the lips. So I'm going to do this here. Uh, into the microphone so you can hear what we do is we essentially tighten our lips if you kind of um, pretend like you're making the you're going to say uh, the syllable m m m 
your lips are kind of pressed together like that. Mm. And then we're going to blow um, pretty hard through the center of our lips while keeping the, the sides tight. And that creates this. And so we're able to move. Sorry, I know that's weird. You're probably like, what the hell is this class? Um, but that creates this, uh, This uh, we have this ability to change the pitch. And then essentially when you do that into a mouthpiece of a brass instrument, it's amplified and made into a pretty sound by the, by the instrument. So we have uh, trumpet, French horn, trombone, euphonium tuba. In the pictures, here's the trumpet. These are actually different types of trumpets. All of these, this is a piccolo trumpet this is a cornet this is a flugelhorn they're all just different types of trumpets this is a french horn this is a trombone this is a, a baritone this is a euphonium they're basically the same instrument this is a tuba um going on here string family uh in orchestral orchestral um music which is what largely we're going to be listening to in this class the big four are violin viola cello and bass those are the big four, and you can see here we've got, um, I actually don't have my glasses on, so it's hard to see, but it looks like that's a violin, viola, cello, and bass there. Uh, there are many, many other string instruments. I put guitar. Guitar is probably the most uh, played instrument in the world, so that's a big deal. Some of you maybe play the guitar. Uh, mandolin, you see they got banjo and harp and lute and all kinds of other stuff. There's many, many uh, string instruments out there. The source of vibration for string instruments, pretty easy, the string. Um, it's either plucked or strummed or uh, you, you use a bow to make the sound come out. Percussion, uh, technically anything that you can hit becomes a percussion instrument. Um, but some of the big ones here I tried to list. So drum kit, drum set would be, uh, this is like kind of part of a drum set over here would be uh, typical, typical three main components of a snare, of a drum kit are snare, bass, and tenor. They usually have some cymbals too and other stuff. But uh, auxiliary percussion is all the kind of the small stuff. So I, I just listed cymbals, castanets. You've got here um, uh, all kinds of other, you know, here's a, 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 a what's that called, tambourine. Um, you've got, you know, bell tree, mark tree. You've got all kinds of little things uh, some maracas it looks like down here uh mallet instruments or keyboard instruments we're talking about things like um xylophone uh, uh, uh marimba vibraphone glockenspiel which is a fancy word for bells um, those are all pitched instruments so they have the same notes as the other instruments we actually count um piano in that category and i know some people may find that a little bit unusual but uh because strings are are there's strings in a piano and that's where the sound comes from but um because we don't play the strings directly on a on a piano on piano we we push the keys and then the keys activate the strings we consider it a percussion instrument so there's percussion. And then voice, um, I don't know if you're aware, but there's actually higher and lower voice types. So the highest voice type, generally speaking, women's voices are higher than men's voices. So a higher female voice tends to be a soprano voice. A lower female voice tends to be an alto voice. A higher male voice tends to be tenor. A lower male voice tends to be bass. Um, and then electronics, uh, it can be a lot of different stuff. So um, sampler, I don't know if you've ever seen a sampler but essentially a sampler will capture a sound and then when you push a button it it replays it it's like a recording device but for short you know maybe only seven seconds or so at a time but then you can have you know 40 or different 40 triggers on a sampler so that you can capture lots and lots of different sounds um, a computer a synthesizer anything like that um, again the source of the vibration for the voice family is going to be the vocal cords the source for Anything electronic is going to be electricity. So if electricity is the source of the vibration, then we can count it in that group. So that's a, a big list. I'm just kind of reviewing it here with you. Again, throughout the semester, throughout the class, you're going to want to be able to refer to those things when you're talking about music. So um, 
you may want to go back and take some more notes if you didn't take notes or refer to this lecture as you're preparing your other stuff because this has got some important terms in it. Okay, moving on. Uh, form. Uh, <clears throat> the macro organization of a piece. Uh, so meaning the from the big picture, what, how is the piece organized? Um, a, way, a way to break this down, I, I, I put is notes combined to make phrases in the same way that think of like letters combined to make sentences and then phrases combined to make periods in the same way that sentences combined to make paragraphs and then periods combined to make sections in the same way that paragraphs combined to make chapters and then the chapters combined to make um, a whole book and similarly the sections of a piece of music combined to make a form the whole the whole piece um, we use letters to symbolize the form. So, for instance, ABA is a three-part form where we have a first section, A, followed by a second section, B, and then the third section is the return of the A section. So, here are examples of common musical forms. We have a two-part form, which is binary, which is represented by the letters A, B. Um, we have rounded binary, which is... Uh, a, B, and then half of A again. We have a ternary form, which is A, B, and then A returns to us again. Rondo, which is an interesting form. I'll play you an example here of, of Rondo. Um, rondo is when you have um, a, th a theme or a section, excuse me, A, and uh, it keeps returning after introducing... A new section so in this case uh, this is one of the more common versions of rondo there's actually different versions of rondo you can have um, we have a the first section and then you have b right well then it returns back to um a again and then we have c which is a third section and a new section of music and then it always has to be a palindrome so it always goes the same uh forwards as it does backwards so you can see um, it goes back to A and then back to B and then back to A again, which is kind of interesting, I think. I don't know if you think so. Let me um, pull up for you. I meant to paste this into the slideshow and I just forgot. Let me pull up for you. This There's the, the class. Um, an example of a rondo here. This is a piece for wind band called Prelude Siciliano and Rondo and Here we go. So here comes the start of the Rondo. Uh, Woo! That's a little loud. This is the introduction, which is actually also the A section, but I'll show you along with the form here. This is A. So now here's B, new section. up B now they're gonna go back to A. You recognize that from before? Now here's a new section C. Back to A. So hopefully you find that a little bit interesting there. That's a kind of a unusual form. Another one, uh, theme and variations. The probably easiest example of this is uh, Mozart did a variation um, on Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. 
So you'll Nobody see here. Nobody knows where great ideas yeah, come. Yeah, an ad. <laughs> um, he's gonna he's gonna start with the main melody, the bomb, bomb, beam, 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 bomb, beam, beam, bomb, bomb, bomb. There it is. And he repeats it in this. So while he's repeating, I'll explain what's going to happen next. Is he's going to start to create new melodies that are based on and derived from the original melody, which means they have the same structure, they have the same harmonic structure, the same length. Um, and so, if you actually, once the first variation starts, if you sing the original melody, you'll see how it fits together. I'll kind of show you. It's wrapping up the. So we would call this A in our form. Now here comes the first variation. So I'll sing now. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high. Like a dot on the It. We call that each variation we call uh, A prime. So this would be A prime. The next one would be A double prime. The next one would be A triple prime. And then just depending on how many there are. In this one, he did 12. So here comes the second variation. So you can see here he, he does 12 of them if you want to hear later on. That one's in the minor. He made it sad. That one's slower and prettier. So uh, that's theme and variations, we call that. Uh, an easy one to recognize that you're probably already familiar with, we call popular song form, where we have verse, chorus, verse, chorus. Um, so I, I think you're probably okay with that one. It's a pretty, pretty common form, but when we go back and forth between verse chorus, call that popular song. There's one more form I want to point out to you. I think it's, uh, it's worth mentioning for a second, spending a little bit of time on. It's a, it's a pretty specific form. It's called Sonata Allegro form. This emerges during the classical time period, which we'll talk about in a couple, couple weeks. Um, so we're talking 1750 to 1820. We're talking the 18th century. And um, the reason why I think this form is interesting is it's it's a three-part form. It's similar to, to ternary, the ABA form. But the difference is there's a lot of specific criteria for each of the sections. And they have fancy terms. So the first section we call the exposition. Second section we call the development. And the third section, the recapitulation. Essentially... The first section, the exposition, a musical idea is introduced, okay? And that's it. That's kind of what happens. Here's a, here's my idea. The second section during the development, that musical idea goes through a period of challenge and um, suffering and difficulty and transformation and exploration. And uh, it, it it's broken up and it's put back together again and it modulates. It goes all over these different places and it's expanded and it's it's just it's it goes through trials and tribulations and then at the end of that process it re-emerges in the recapitulation usually a little bit different than where it started the exposition usually it's a little bit improved it's a little bit better sometimes it's just back to the old exposition as it was but normally there's some kind of improvement that happens well, I think this is fascinating because I see a lot of parallels in our society broadly between this this idea of threeness and specific, specifically this idea of um, idea challenging of the idea and then resolution of the idea. Um, so just to give you um, a sense of what I'm talking about, movies. Movies uh, generally occur in three acts. I don't know if you know this. And they actually use the same word exposition for the first act. 
Um, so <clears throat> we have uh, that that basic um, structure, but then also if you think of like more specifically like a rom com, a romantic comedy, it always follows the same basic structure, right? Where uh, the first act, the first section, the guy meets girl, uh, the guy's too cool, the girl's too busy, they don't like each other. They think they're annoying. Uh, they get on each other's nerves. And then what always happens at the end of the first act, they fall in love, right? So then the second act, they're in love. They're going through the relationship. Things are cruising along, going well. And then what always happens at the end of the second act, usually the guy does something stupid, <laughs> right? And they uh, break up or their, you know, their relationship's in jeopardy. And then the third act, they're um, suffering and they're sad and they're alone and they're never never going to get over it and then what always happens at the end of the third act is they get back together and they they resolve whatever the problem was in the first place right i see a huge similarity here between sonata leg reform and that jokes when we tell jokes it's never five guys walked into a bar right it's never like 17 guys walked into a bar the first guy said the third guy the 12th guy no it's always three right there's something about threeness um that works for our brain so um here i'll tell you the only clean joke i know uh that that makes this point of threes okay uh so there's three guys going on a trip to the desert and they decide to break up to get supplies and meet back up um to share what they got before they leave so the first guy uh, leaves and he gets food and he comes back and when everyone's sharing what they got they go what did you get and he goes i got food and they go why'd you get food and he goes, so in case we get hungry, we can eat, right? That makes sense. <laughs> and so then the second guy goes, and he gets water. And he comes back, and the other guys go, why did you get water? And he goes, in case we get thirsty, we can drink. This sounds logical, doesn't it? The third guy, it's always the third guy, right? <laughs> the third guy gets a car door. And he comes back, and they go, why did you get a car door? And he goes, in case it gets uh, hot, we can roll down the window. <laughs> That's the stupidest joke I know. But, um, but again, it, it shows that structure of threeness and how we, we, we see that show up in jokes a lot of the time. The Socratic method, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Socratic method, it is eerily similar to this. So the Socratic method, we have different fancy terms. Um, we have an idea that's put forth, a thesis, right? Uh, um, and then we have the arguments against the thesis the reasons why the thesis is wrong the antithesis and then we have the resolution of that in the antecedent so we have these um this method that socrates set up of how to arrive at truth state an idea challenge the idea debate the idea point out what's wrong with the idea and then from that process you arrive at a better idea a more true idea um and then finally think of the resurrection in religions obviously christianity is is uh, probably the religion most people are aware of and you have this same three-part um story to the story of jesus so part one he's born into this world he lives his life he performs miracles he uh, uh um not lectures what's the word for spreads the word of, of the bible and then at, at the end of part one, he is uh, crucified. He is killed. And so part two of the story is for a few days, he's, he's dead. And then the last part of the story is he comes back. He's resurrected, right? That's, it's like the most important part of Christianity in terms of theological belief that uh, Jesus came back to life. So it even shows up in our myths around religion our, our 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 theology around religion so i think it's an interesting uh form that has some deep connections to society at large i uh stupidly put in this fake uh tra trailer about a black widow rom-com wait let's skip it you love the Marvel Universe, Avengers, Age of Ultron, Thor, Captain America, Iron Man. But you want to know, why no Black Widow movie? Does Marvel not know how to make a girl superhero movie? Chill. Marvel Gets Women. Coming in 2016. 
When it came to life in the big city, Black Widow had it all figured out. Remind me to call whoever invented heels and leave them a nasty message. A huge apartment, great friends, and an internship at Fashion Weekly. Where's the new girl? Sorry, here. Leather with a low neckline. Take that off. And put it on the cover of our magazine. The only thing missing in Black Widow's life... Such a klutz. <laughs> ...was love. Hey, I'm Ultron. Black Widow. You wanna grab a coffee? I don't really have time to date any guys now. So. What about robots? <laughs> <laughs> so, who's the guy? Why do you think there's always a guy, Thor? Honey, you're putting ketchup on your cereal. From Marvel Studios and the writers of 27 Dresses comes the story of a superhero and her super romance. Venus activated. I don't know, Black Widow. I think you're moving way too fast with this guy. Does he even know anything about you? Like that your favorite food is ice cream? Hey, BW, your boyfriend is on the news. As a robot named Ultron threw a bus at the Fashion Weekly building. And I'd hate to be that guy's girlfriend. No, I'm never gonna cry again. Yeah, I've done it for the last time. Goodbye. What are you doing here? You know how much that job meant to me? I... Do you even know what my favorite food is? Pizza? <laughs> Thank you. For Black Widow, falling in love can be hard, but it can also be incredible. Where you go? Paris. France. But if you go Paris, then who help Hulk? Eat ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Black Widow, Age of Me. Marvel, we know girls. Thanks for what? Sorry, that was very stupid, but. Okay, uh, last thing to cover here is texture. Uh, when we talk about musical texture, we're talking about the depth of musical content, uh, which probably still sounds confusing, but I'll, I'll give you an example here that I think will make sense. Start by. Um, writing these down monophonic homophonic heterophonic polyphonic we're going to define them here and i'll give you examples monophonic if we break this down mono that uh phoneme means one right you've probably seen that before um <clears throat> one and then phonic comes from the, the the phoneme phono which means sound so literally if we translate from the latin it means mono phono means one sound uh, so what that means in music is we have a single line of music. That's it. There's one melody, period, okay? And the song I use to make this uh, example here that I think makes sense is Row, Row, Row Your Boat because um, at some point in your life you probably sang Row, Row, Row in Your Boat in elementary school, I hope, and it'll make sense. So if we all just sang Row, Row, Row Your Boat together, Row, Row, Row Your Boat gently down this, and we all sang it at the same time, that's monophonic, okay? Homophonic, if we break down the parts of the word again, homo comes from Latin means same, and then phonic again is phono, which means sound. So same sound. Uh, that would be if we have essentially one melody with some backup. So with uh, usually some kind of chord held out, uh, Things. So here, here's how I do it in class usually, and you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit because, again, we're doing this online, so there's no class environment. But if we have, uh, if I had, what I would do with the class is I'd have some of the class just go, row, row, and they would just repeat that over and go, right, row, and then I would come in and sing, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream, and they're still going, row, merrily, 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 life. That creates a homophonic texture where there's one melody 
and there's some background that is supporting the melody, but it is not um, an independent line. It's not its own thing. Heterophonic, hetero means uh, different, phono again means sound. Heterophonic would be um, if we took little like versions or little um, snippets of the melody and we kind of put that up against the melody. So if um, if you went um, <coughs> merrily down the stream, merrily down the stream, and you just kept repeating that over and over again, merrily down the stream, merrily, down, merrily row your boat, merrily row your, or something like that. And then I came in a row, row, row your boat. On top of that, that would be heterophonic. You're not going to come across heterophonic very much, so don't worry about it. Monophonic, you will. Homophonic, you will. Polyphonic is a big deal. Polyphonic is um, many mu music historians consider the invention of polyphony, which happened during the Renaissance, to be the most important thing that's ever happened in the history of music. So polyphonic is when we have multiple melodies at the same time. So we finally get to what you probably did at school at some point when you sang row, row, you but you'd have like, you know, you divide the class into four groups. You'd have like group one, group two, group three, group four, and then you'd start the singing um, at different times. So like group one would go row, 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 your butt. They'd keep going and then group two would come in row, 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 your butt. Group three would come in, et cetera, et cetera. It's hard to demonstrate that by myself here, but um, you get the idea. We ha we call that a canon sometimes, but there's multiple melodies happening on top of each other at the same time. That's polyphonic texture. So the big difference is between monophonic and polyphonic. That's basically the difference between uh, the Renaissance and the medieval time period that came before it. So you want to make sure you understand that. Okay, my friends. Not bad, right? That was only 36 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions about that, you're going to want to write those down, email me, um, or show up and ask them in yourself. Okay? All right.